People say that a picture is worth a thousand words, but are there downsides to images? Welcome to The Conquering Truth. I'm Dan Horn. I'm Jonathan Sides. I'm Charles Churchill. And I'm Joshua Horn. In the second commandment, God warns us not to, to make images and to bow down and worship them. And clearly there's, there's reasons that he's specifically saying about images. And as we, in our society, we have become much more image-based over the last 75 years where with televisions and everything else that we've shifted from being word-based to being much more image-based just because of the advent of new technology. So as we consider that, so there's clearly some advantages to that, but we should also consider the disadvantages. What are the disadvantages to images? I mean, part of the tension that you have to deal with is the fact that you do live in a world that God made that's full of things to look at and that God gave people eyes to look at things. I mean, so, you know, and I, I, I don't think that's a trivial place to start, to just recognize the fact that there are images, the fact that that we can even, as humans, make visual representations. You can't say that that by in and of itself is, is problematic. But then you, the tension that you have to deal with is something like the Second Commandment, which we'll talk about in detail, where God really says, hey, there are dangers to those in particular contexts. So a lot of this is teasing out what are the contexts in which they're appropriate and inappropriate and why and how that affects us. I think part of it is as well is there are certain things, obviously, that, you know, the, the technological advantage, advances in the world, if you're not a Christian, you look at them and you go, they're, they're kind of by happenstance or they just kind of happen. But there is a part of it where if God wanted those technological advances to have happened earlier, he could have made them happen earlier. And so there is this part of it where you also look at the fact that he chose to communicate his word and he chose to communicate these things by words rather than by images. And so there is, so you also have, I think that gets added into the tension in the sense that there's words have a certain, words have a certain use to them. Words have a certain means to them. And, and so we should think about those things and consider the trade-offs between them. Like where you started at the beginning of an image is worth a thousand words and you can go, is it? You know, I mean, and that, it's a valid question to ask. Is that always true? Is that sometimes true? And, and why and what are the cases that, that, that shape that answer? And I think, you know, I think you can also equally make the argument that a picture is worth a thousand words. You can easily make the same argument that a word, a word is worth a thousand pictures because it depends on what you're trying to express. Because there are certain things that are a lot easier to express in a picture you want to describe a landscape, landscape, a picture is going to do it a lot better than words are. It's going to take a lot of words to get the same amount of inf information. But if you want to explain emotions, pictures aren't very good at that. They're good at moving your emotions but not explaining things. And so just when we think about this, you know, that's really simplifying things to say a picture is worth a thousand words because it really depends on what you're trying to convey. But before we discuss these other things, we should probably read the Second Commandment. That's usually pretty useful to actually go to Scripture and see what the warning is. And it's from you know, one of the cases it's in Exodus 20, verses 4 through 6. You shall not make for yourselves a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. So as we, I mean, the, the commandment is very specifically about worship. And so you can't take it and you can't make it and broaden it to say there's no purpose for images anywhere. Because clearly even in and you know, God uses images that aren't to be bowed down and worshipped. He uses images in the tabernacle. He uses them in the temple. He uses them with the bronze serpent. I mean, he uses images that are, you know, the picture of the, the bronze altar where you're doing the burnt sacrifices. I mean, those are visual things that people can see, and he's conveying real information in those. So he's not against the conveyance of information through, through visual means. But at the same time, the word is really necessary. And when you get to the point where it's things that are unseen, it gets to be very dangerous to start to just use the image where you never have seen the original. Well, what do you mean something unseen? God. God, angels. There's things that we speculate about that we start to do images of. The incarnation of Jesus Christ. The incarnation of Jesus Christ. The, 
the wise men, the I mean, and this starts to be a problem that that you're not that you bow down to them, but that you're also you're also conveying things that God said it was sufficient with his word to convey. And it's important to note that the second commandment is nested in the context of the first commandment. Right. That you shall have no other gods before me. I mean, that really, it, it does set context for all the commandments that follow it. And so, you know, it's really helpful to point out that this is a commandment that is centrally talking about worship and the use of images in worship. Um, and and not bowing down to those. Well, if you if you say it's it's following in the heels of the first commandment, saying not to have any other gods before me, and then you've got this one, and then you think about okay, so what's the historical context in which this is dropping? It's in to a people who've just come out of a nation full of visual idols. They're on their way to the land of Canaan, full of visual idols, and God's saying. I'm not that kind of God, and I'm not going to be worshipped in that kind of way. And in the same way, I mean, it's one of those things where I think if you look at some of the other episodes we've done where we talk about idolatry, one of the useful things is, is you know, people frequently go, they pretend like idolatry is this old-fashioned thing that no one, that really doesn't exist anymore. And when you talk about them being in Egypt, like with full of visual idolatry, one of the things that was used as visual idol- idolatry was the sun, you know, I mean, it was something as simple as the, you know, is it, and so there's this part of it where we just forget, I mean, the, it's nested in the, in the, in the, like you said, in the context of worship. And one of the things we need to remember is, is worship is, worship is something that humans do, sometimes whether they realize they're doing it or not. And sometimes they pretend like they're not doing it when they know that they're doing it. And so the whole mix of when you should use images and how you should use images and how images are being used to influence you is part of the context of how aware you are of the role of your aspect of worship in your life. I think another thing that's really important to understand is to understand how all the commandments work because they all work where, you know, like thou thou shalt not commit adultery. That doesn't mean that that's not also outlawing fornication. It also doesn't mean that it's not outlawing gluttony drunkenness because these all fall under sins of the flesh the worst sin of the flesh is adultery which is what the commandment's about so when you look at here and say don't make an image to bow down that doesn't say you're allowed to do images for anything else that you want as long as you don't bow down to them because this is just the the worst manifestation of false worship right is that you make a graven image that you bow down to but you then have to say how does this apply to other forms of worship Right. Honor your father and mother doesn't mean they're the only people that you have to honor, that they're your only family members that are worthy of honor, and that the, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a broader right. when sense. When you think of, about it, it's why you honor the civil magistrate. It's connected. It's just that not honoring your father and mother means that you almost certainly won't honor the civil magistrate. And so on the other side, one of the, one of the, you know, one of the risks of images is that they really implant ideas into people's minds that aren't that aren't biblical. There's no biblical basis for them. For instance, most people immediately think there's three wise men. They've seen pictures of it. They've seen nativity scenes that have it in. And the Bible doesn't say that at all. There's three gifts, but that doesn't mean that there were three wise men. All we know is that there were more than one, that they were plural. And chances are it was a significant number. They traveled a long way. Or, you know, how many nativity scenes do you see where you have a baby in Mary's arms when the three wise men come. Well, Herod killed children under the age of two for a reason. It wasn't because he was an idiot and just didn't think that, you know, Jesus was just born. No, he's a toddler almost certainly by the time. He's somewhere between one year and two years of age by the time the wise men get there. But they probably went back to the manger and they got the shepherds back. <laughs> you know, <laughs> exactly. It was, it was a, it was a yet, recreation. <laughs> but yet we see these pictures and all of a sudden, these things become accepted in the society because those images are very powerful, that that's what people remember. And they don't remember what the words actually say because the words are much more explicit about what happened. You know, I was reading a book recently about someone who there's no you know, surviving portraits of. And the, the term he uses is that, you know, all the portraits that exist are fictions, which is, I mean, which is somewhat obvious, but it's not. Normally we think, well, it's the artist's best you know, reconstruction of what happened or how he looked. But, you know, actually it's a fiction. Now, a lot of people are okay with, you know, fictional Bible stories, but let's be clear about what it is. They are fictional. But And, and I was reading a book recently, too. I don't know if it was the <laughs> same book or not, but even talking about the first drawing of the person, and it's, I don't even remember who it was, but it was somebody that, 
that if you know much about history, you would recognize the picture. And it was done 40 years after he died. Nobody knew what he looked like. Nobody even survived long enough that was even informing him what it looked like. It was just the guy just wanted a picture for his book, so he drew him, and everybody said, oh, this is what the guy looks like now from then on. Can we, like, pull up the picture, like, a test of do we know much about history? <laughs> Are you going to leave us hanging? Who is this person? I don't Does remember. it matter? <laughs> Would I be embarrassed if I didn't recognize him and the other three of you did? <laughs> It's even worse. I can't remember who it was. I remember the story, though. <laughs> the power of images strikes again. Right? Well, see, I listened to it on a book, so I don't remember the image. <laughs> but you were talking about images. That was I the know. problem. You bought a picture book on tape. <laughs> this this ties into what you said earlier about drawing things in Scripture that we don't have because you do – I mean, it's really a thing to remember is when you're teaching your children, there are things that they'll they'll never be able to get out of their head once you show it to them. And it's one of the dangers of children's Bibles. With, with pictures in them, because in the end, you're, you're giving them things. You're, first of all, you're telling them that, that images are just as valuable as words in some ways, that the Word of God and some of these images, you're putting them on the same level. They're both in their Bible. So they're going to read the words of God on one page, and on the other hand, they're going to see a picture that was drawn by someone and that wasn't drawn by God. And so, first of all, just they're both in the Bible, and your kids aren't going to be able to differentiate between those two. And then the second thing is, is there's going to be things in there that no matter what the words say, they're never going to be able to get out of their head, or it would take them great effort to replace those images with the truth of the word. Children Bible almost always are cartoon characters. And then you show them a picture of Mickey Mouse, and you expect a four-year-old to be able to tell the difference between this fictional character and this one's real when they look the same, and they know both of them are fictional. A four-year-old recognizes that the cartoon Jesus is fictional. And so all of a sudden, they're thinking they're no different than Santa Claus. Your children's Bible is putting Jesus Christ on the same level as Santa Claus and on the same level as Mickey Mouse. I mean, it is a very dangerous thing. And then you have to spend the rest of the time trying to get that out of their mind because you're going, no, he's real. Well, no, he's as real as Mickey Mouse is what you've already told him with your children's Bible. It's a very dangerous thing to take christ and make him a cartoon it's a dangerous thing to make him two-dimensional it's a dangerous thing to make him out of time which means that as soon as you render a statue he's all of a sudden out of time rather than he is the ruler sitting on the throne right now and all of a sudden you do these things that all minimize who he is and it's an incredibly dangerous thing to do and then you think that you're helping your children when the reality is is that you know what's the what's the beginning of wisdom what's the beginning of knowledge fear of the lord Drawing Jesus Christ like a cartoon character is not moving your child towards fearing God. You are trying, when you do that, you're moving him away from being saved rather than toward salvation. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Cartoon Bibles, which is a better term than a children's Bible, cartoon Bibles are trying to teach your child not to believe in Christ. Because to believe, he first has to fear. And, you know, if the second commandment wasn't clear enough, then Christ is called the word. (laughs) <laughs> You're going to make the word into an image. It, not, not, not great. He's also called the truth. And the images that we have of Jesus, Our that's fiction. not what he looks like. <laughs> They're not the truth. And so you take the truth and make it a lie. You take, you know, you take the creator of all and make him two-dimensional. I mean, it's, these are very dangerous things. And I would think you would, I mean, so when I was growing up, none of the children's Bible I had ever did, they wouldn't have, I mean, when I was growing up, they wouldn't have dreamed of doing cartoon Jesus at that point. So, I mean, having, those are the common ones. Now. Having, having real life pictures isn't much better. I mean, that's right. That's, I mean, I just want to make that Jesus point. Jesus is a beautiful Scotsman. Right. Isn't I mean, that much better. Right. Or even if somebody did it and they did artistic of, we went and we looked at a, a hundred people that were Jewish and Aramaic and all these different races and we drew, no, just, I mean, understand what you're doing. You're, you're not solving the problem. I think that's, you know, I think I think there are people who are going to go, well, we, we did real depictions of things, so we've solved a lot of that problem. You're not and it's solving It's still a problem. lie. I mean, right. Everybody knows it's a lie. You know, a lot of people on their phone, they, you know, a lot of wives have a picture of their husband on their phone. And how would you feel if your wife had a picture of a man on the phone that was a lot more handsome than you are and was showing it to everybody saying, this is my husband? Do you think that would make you a little jealous? Or a cartoon version of you. Or a cartoon version. But even if it's a picture of a man that doesn't look like you, and 
let's be serious, all the fake Jesuses, they're all more handsome than a nondescript Jewish man, which is who Christ is described as being in the Bible. And if, if the bride of Christ is walking around showing these pictures saying, this is what my husband looks like, every man knows that he would be upset if his wife was doing that. He'd be jealous if his wife was doing that. And one of the characteristics of God that is stressed over and over again is he is a jealous God. For the church to use any image that doesn't actually look like Christ is to, to, to incur the jealousy of God. And we don't have any idea what Christ looked like. So we know we don't have a picture of him because God decided that we should not. You know, going back to Charles's point from early on, if if God, in fact, does rule and control all things, if he had wanted us to have that technology available at the time when Jesus was walking in the earth, he would have made it so. But he didn't. And nobody painted Jesus. Nobody had him sit for a portrait. We don't have, didn't have cameras, didn't have videos. It's just not there. But over and over and over, it's the word. The word became flesh. And that's what's really emphasized. That's what we're supposed to key in on. And, I mean, you know, it's the, the Romans had all kinds of good sculptors. They, there could have easily been an image of Jesus, you know, even without a supernatural, uh, you know, change of technology. You know, it was very possible, but it didn't happen because we didn't need that. And then you have the fact that in the New Testament, one of the phrases says that Jesus Christ is the very image of God. And the way that we know and see that image is through the word and by the spirit of God. And so, I mean, there's this part of it where it's not saying Jesus is the image of God and we're not going to show him to you. So you're out of luck. If you didn't live when Jesus Christ was on earth, you can't see Jesus Christ. No, the answer is, is that the word of God is sufficient for you to be able to see Jesus Christ. And the, the reason that there's such a desire to have a, a picture of Jesus is because that people are looking at it in a carnal way, in a physical way. In the real image of God, Christ, who is the real image of God the Father, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, as he says, that, that it's not his physical characteristics. It's his righteousness. It's his peace. It's his, his, his you know, being the servant of all. This is what the image of God is. The image of God is not what physically he looks like, but yet yet people want to eliminate the spiritual and get it back to the physical because the physical doesn't require you to die to yourself. It doesn't require you to change. You can just go, oh yeah, I worship that physical Jesus, but you're saved by spiritual things, not by being in the flesh. I remember having a conversation with some friends back when Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ was coming out. Um, And, you know, aside from I'm sure we'll talk more about Jesus movies as things go on. But, you know, aside from the fact that it's made by a company called Icon Productions, which is sort of telegraphing that this is a second commandment violation. Um, aside from that, I said, you know, hey, you, you realize when you start focusing on these kinds of pictures of Jesus, you're missing out on the pictures of Jesus that we're supposed to have. And, and Jesus even tells us what some of those are. And I know it's kind of sideways, but it's the way we're supposed to think about these things. Jesus says, you know, hey, you know, when I was in prison, you visited me. And when I was sick, you, you, when, when I was hungry, you cared for me. And when I was naked, you clothed me. And, and the, they, they're like, when did we ever do any of this for you, Jesus? And he says, when you did it for the least of these. And you know what he's saying right there is he's saying like, you want to know, you want to see me, go look at somebody that needs help and help them. And that's how you see me. And you, you know, that is so much more powerful than anything you can put up on a wall. So much more powerful to have that kind of experience. And that's how Jesus says, you want to look at me? That's how you look at me. I'm not going to find, you're not going to find him painted somewhere. So before we get too far off, we should ask the question. So why is the conquering truth in video if we're talking about how bad images are? When we were deciding to do this, we debated just doing it in, in audio. And part of it is we had experience with video. There were other things that had been done. And like you said in the beginning, video is not a wrong way to engage. 
it's not it's not fundamentally flawed to do video and we do live in a society that's inundated with video and so we thought this might be you know can we actually set something up we we wanted to try to make sure that we didn't use video i mean let's be honest the four of us you know i mean we're, we're we don't believe we're luring people into <laughs> any form of fundamental idolatry here we don't believe we're causing people to sin by gaze upon us and you know see the pinnacle of manhood i mean you know i mean this is this is not what we believe we're causing people to do so we thought it was a reasonable way to do to actually engage and we thought there were things that we could actually do with video like when we've done the you know the the state of the union and and playing some of the video and playing some of the footage of other things that have gone on that we could use technology right. to allow us to do that we've used graphs and stuff and in in using the video what we're not trying to do is create fake things right the video isn't that much different than us sitting in this room and if we had an audience here that was watching us it wouldn't look that much different right we're not like trying to create and trying to produce something that looks substantially different than just four guys sitting around the table right there is a real point to the fact and the reason that i wanted to raise the question there's a real point to the fact that video is useful for things and when we say that you have to be careful with it we're not saying there's no purpose to it at all because there is a purpose to it but we also have to say, especially in terms of worship of God, in terms of making images of, of things that people don't know what the truth is, that it can be very dangerous to, to do that. And, and it can be in violation of the second commandment to do that if you're bowing down and worshiping it. If you're creating something that you're calling Jesus, you have a duty to worship it if it's Jesus. And if it's not, why are you lying? And so, but that doesn't mean that there is no purpose for images. Images can convey a lot of knowledge. They can convey a lot of, not a lot of knowledge, but a lot of information. And and, the, and we're also not saying that this is the, you know, anything that's more produced than this podcast, that's a problem. No, so. not at all. <laughs> One thing that we should recognize is how frequently God uses images. And he uses them quite a bit, right? And he uses images that were written to us, but in a lot of cases they were seen by the people who originally received the words. Like in Numbers 21, 8, where they have the serpent that are biting people and they're dying. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was if a serpent had bitten anyone. When he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. And we know from the New Testament that this is to be a picture of Christ. That this is the idea that Christ gets lifted up and raised up on a pole. And that you have to look to Christ. And so God is using an image. And at the same time, and he's using it in a way that's clearly not sinful and clearly useful and all these other things. And so there can be places for that. But at the same time, you go on, right? And it's not too long in Second Kings 18.4 where it says, He removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden image and broken pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan. And so they took that serpent that God made that was not sinning in making it, but yet look how quickly they made it into an idol and were burning incense to it, and they were worshiping it. So we should recognize that, yes, there's a place to use images to convey information because that's why God had him put the bronze serpent on a pole. That's what it says in the New Testament. We know that for a fact. But at the same time, that information also was used to lead them to idolatry because of the, the wickedness of their hearts. Those kinds of cases are really useful in that you can say it helps you interpret the second commandment for sure. And you can say, okay, even though the second commandment starts with what sounds like what might be a blanket prohibition against all image making whatsoever, which is the, the Muslim interpretation of it. That's why they have no representational art. Their art's all geometric. Um, you know, but then you read through all these cases where God says, make this image, make a bronze serpent and lift it up so everyone can look on it and be saved, you know. Um, so they're useful for those kinds of things. But then also you recognize what God did for us with the making of those images was not preserve those images for us. We have no idea what Moses's bronze serpent looked like. We have it's no idea. It's not like the thing on the, you know, the medical thing. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> but we don't I'm know. I don't, I don't think you that know, there's much evidence. We don't this. know what a cherubim looks like representationally because it's kind of hard to figure out how you depict this thing with four faces, and yet God says you're supposed to put them on the inside of the tabernacle walls in the curtains. But what God has preserved for us are these descriptions of them. 
I was really struck by this. We're, we're going through the book of Exodus right now, and I know this is going to seem a little abstract, but the, the Ark of the Covenant is this gold. It's this wood box that's overlaid with gold, and the inside of the box is overlaid with gold. And that is really, I find that to be incredibly significant because once they make that box, there's no point that they're supposed to open that box. There's, there's no weekly, monthly, annual feasts. There's no festival. There's no, ju- there's, there's no occasion in which they ever are supposed to open that box. In fact, the vast majority of people never even see the box. High priest sees it once a year, and every other time it's covered up. Nobody, but God said, put gold on the inside. So God's saying, here, make this thing. I want you to make this thing, but you're never, nobody ever looks at it. It's not there to be seen. But he does record in Scripture very plainly and many times over, talks about how the inside of the box is overlaid with gold. And we're supposed to reflect on, hey, that has some meaning about the nature and character of God and how he interacts with the world. And, you know, I mean, this is, this is right underneath the mercy seat. So there's something there that we're supposed to meditate on from the description of it, but nobody was ever supposed to see it. That, the seeing it was not meaningful. There were people who lived in the time who the the most they knew about it was from reading, would have been from hearing the words of Exodus than from seeing the Ark of the Covenant itself. Just like us. Right, right. When we think of images, some of the images we get are purely from words. And that we literally have an image in our head, but that image came from the words, and that's the only place where that image lives is in the words. And that's not inappropriate. God right. intends for us to do that. He contends, intends for, when he gives you the dimensions and the descriptions of things, you're supposed to think, okay, so what is something that's about two and a half cubits high? You know, mentally, how big would that have been? You know, that that's meaningful, but actually what it looks like in 3D space, God didn't intend for us to know that. And I mean, there is a sense that in your mind, there's a, a picturing of it, but one of the big advantages of that uh, compared to actually rendering a picture is that we read about the cherubim and their wings touching over the mercy seat. And the picture that Joshua has in his mind, the picture that Charles has in his mind, the picture Jonathan has in his mind, and my picture are all different. And the reality is that if we say something based on the picture that we've created in our mind that doesn't agree with the words, somebody else is going to go, no, I don't think that's what it looked like at all. And there's a check. As soon as you put up, for instance, if you say the wise men came and visited Jesus, I might think there's three. You might think there's 200, right? (laughs) But then there's this natural check. But as soon as you render a picture and all all of us look at it and we think that picture's right or we think the experts have done the picture, so we're going to trust them, then all of a sudden we can't correct it because we all have the same picture. And the reality is people do make mental images, and that's not inherently wrong, but it is making those mental images, there's an inherent you know, ability to check on them because other people won't have the same image. As soon as you actually render it into something physical that everybody sees, all of a sudden everybody has unity about a falsehood. And your brain doesn't remember things in the same way that you imagine in your mind as it does when you see them. Sure. There's a part of it where light that goes into the, I mean, just the way the brain stores information, it is very different. The thing that you hold in your head, it might have changed 20 times over the years as you've done it, and you didn't even, you weren't even aware of the evolution of it in your mind because in the sense of it was changing as your thoughts changed, whereas your memory of the thing that you saw, it kind of becomes anchored and it becomes fixed. And that's one of the advantages of this is that as your as your even maturity in Christ grows and your maturity in, as your maturity even as a person grows, as you read things over time, your mental image of things will change because and that that's easy to happen whereas it's hard for you you have to fight against the actual representation to change so what are the advantages of images compared to uh to compared to words right we say a picture is worth a thousand words i mean in what way is a picture worth a thousand words so one of the advantages of images is that it simpli- it can simplify things that are complex and and it's an in a and it can you can say that in different ways it can make you feel like you've simplified something that's complex. It can make you feel like you've conveyed all the information about something that's complex. Whereas in reality, frequently images are an abstraction. I mean, the images are, are always inherently. an abstraction because right. they're not, you know. But sometimes they are an abstraction that's abstracting the information that you want. So right. it's not necessarily that, yes, there's a loss of information if you take a picture of a mountain. But at the same time, that can convey a whole bunch of things about the mountain that might be all that you want to convey. Right. 
I mean, they they're they can offer a compactness of information. They can condense large amounts of information into a small representational space. Um, you know, for example, as we're walking back here to do the podcast, it's it's evening and the stars are really bright tonight. There's one particularly bright one right next to the moon, and I thought maybe that's a planet. So I pull out my phone, whip out my astronomy app, and open it up, and it shows me a visual rep. It shows me a picture. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, that's Jupiter right there. It would have been really hard for me to get that information from a string of text. Right. Um, just to, to collate the particular time and location and altitude and, and all of those things to, to get me to the point of, I just want to know what that thing is next to the moon. Picture did it for me really quickly. I mean, another advantage is many images are pretty cross-cultural, cross-language. Um, not all, but a lot of them are, and you can show anyone on earth a picture of a tree and it's going to mean something when words wouldn't one other uh usefulness of, of video or of images is just the fact of people will say the phrase seeing is believing and now we kind of have this doubt of things because of things can be edited and stuff but there's been a very long period of time where images and, and video were used as proof of things there were times you know people would say this never happened and someone brings photo they bring video they actually show that it happens and there are still contexts where videos can be brought from where people actually still they recognize this because is absolutely it, you an can unquestionably investigate and tell whether things have been edited usually right. i mean it takes a lot of skill to be able to edit in right. a way that you can't detect and so i mean these i mean there are things where today with the proliferation of cell phone cameras where i mean you know there are things there whether it's police brutality whether it's even just keeping police from being brutal the fact the fact that people have these cameras the fact that everyone could be recording something at any given moment causes there to be a greater level of accountability because showing that video actually does cause real results because people look at it they see it and they believe it i mean that's why police are often required to wear body cameras or required to have body cameras on in certain contexts and required to not release that footage under any, <laughs> under any, any circumstances. circumstance there's the advantages of images and then some of the things that that are disadvantages of images is that images are because they are compact in the information and because there is in a sense an information overload meaning that it takes you more to see them and to process them it is easy to use images to drive a narration that's easier to get the people to go along with than it is with words you're saying it's easier to manipulate people with a string of pictures yes <laughs> like a movie like a movie okay <laughs> that would be one example but even, like, but even a documentary yeah there's a broad a breadth of images right if you have somebody that's just being interviewed on a camera for a documentary then that's different because that's not that much different than sitting there and talking to them but if you start to use images that are conveying information that's beyond the information conveyed by somebody speaking. That once you do that, what you can very easily do is outrun people's capacity to consider it. And so that what they do is they just follow the argument without being able to be critical of the argument because they don't have the time to be able to critique the argument. Because the next image is coming and they want to follow along. They chose to watch the documentary. They chose to watch the movie. So as that next image comes along, they accept the previous image so that they can stay involved. They can stay. They can keep right. up with the story. And you can really sucker people into believing things that are just ridiculous this way. And when so, you say information, of course, is not like facts. It's like, you know... That the lighting, the pacing, you know, the I mean, music, which is not. I'm images, even saying just the lot. visual. You see the the image, and your mind has to process that image to figure out what it is, which is different amount of thought than hearing words and interpreting. I mean, sometimes are. it can be data, like actual data. It's just oversimplified to the point of where what you're saying isn't true. But in the end, so that I mean, you're sometimes you can just be tricking them. Sometimes it's sometimes it's the fact that what you're saying, you know, it's. it's what you're talking about, like using effects to get them to believe something to influence them. But other times it's just literally that, like you said, they don't have time to keep up with everything and you've abstracted things down into the simple representation and they're just going from piece to piece to piece and going, that makes sense, that makes sense, that makes sense. Therefore, conclusion. In order to try and tease out what the real problem is, is, is it the pacing of it? In, in, you know, in that sense, how is that different than, say, a sermon? where the pastor just moves from one point to the next, you know, I mean, there, there is a structure and a logic to it, but he's just moving along. It's not a book where I can pause, meditate, think about it, come back to it. Or for that matter, you know, 
our podcast that we're doing right now, unless somebody's pushing the pause button to digest things at appropriate intervals, how is that any different than what we're doing at One this of, moment? I think there's a couple differences. One is that, that, first of all, it's easier to process language. I mean, it's easier to hear the words. There's not as much information that's coming across at the same rate with words as there is with images. And so you can actually keep up mentally easier with Im- or with words than you can with images. And then the other thing that happens, I think, a lot more with words, like a sermon, because I preach a lot, I see this all the time, is what you do is if it's something that actually causes somebody to think, they will stop listening. But that usually doesn't happen with video. They, because they don't want to lose track, they actually stay engaged with the video and they don't check out and think. You'd have to but close you your that eyes. You'd have to close your eyes to stop paying attention to the video. Whereas you, I mean, you know, what I mean, it's I'm just not that fascinating when I preach that everybody isn't staring at me. Well, I'm just saying. I mean, it's just it's interesting because in the end, I mean, your your ears have. I mean, your your hearing you can you can cut it off in a way that it's harder to cut off what you're seeing. And I'm just I mean, you, visual things keep you engaged in a different way. And, and there's, I mean, the thing too is it's also a matter of you know scale, you know, on this issue because you know there's I mean, like I mean it's like ser- there's definitely sermons where people are going through they're giving you a bunch of scripture references, but then if you saw that in written form and you take time to look that up, suddenly their argument falls apart where it was sounding sure. pretty good listening to it. So it is kind of you know it's not it's th- this particular issue is not something that you can't do in a sermon, um, and perhaps you know. That, you know, the Bible is written. It's text. It's not. It's not even a spoken spoken but word. It, but it does say in Romans ten, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So we do know that hearing is is the natural way. But and I and I would completely agree that with video you can do it, so it doesn't do it. And with even with preaching that you can do it. I mean, I've heard sermons that that's clearly what they're trying to do. I mean, you listen to it, and it's so illogical. But yet they're trying to they stir up emotion and then they drop out a point that really doesn't logically follow, but they have the people's emotions. And so you can it's just harder to do it. I mean, you have to be a lot more skilled to do it in audio than you do with video. I mean, let's let's even put this in the context of where we started as we talked about how technology has caused some of these changes and the technological progressions that we're dealing with is it used to be there was a point where a lot of the information that people consumed that was shared was shared either by word of mouth or by things were written down and they read them like if you were going to share your political ideas you I mean you would you would write them and you would pass them and people would actually sit down and have to read them it takes a lot more work to put something into written form it takes a lot more thought because because people are going to analyze it in a different way than something that you just said for the very reasons that you're talking about it's something that said you could kind of go back and correct yourself in a written form you have you had time to correct yourself before you <laughs> before you shipped it off and so and then there's radio you know and then we went from went from written form and then there was radio which was which was word based and now we're at you know now we're at the fact that almost everything is video and so there is this part of it where technology has enabled us to convey information in different ways but it's also changed the nature of how thoughtful we are about the things that we see and the things we receive and so i mean part of the conversation we're having we're at the point where we're talking about video but there is this there is this whole spectrum of things that as a nation or as civil as cultures we've kind of we've moved away from consuming as much information through written means and we've moved much towards consuming things in visual media and it's had i mean all of these things are in play it's not just about images but it is about that progression and i mean i remember being ancient i remember when i was young that everybody with television they said it's dumbing down america and you look you know 50 years later and it has. There's no question that it has. I mean, it's very clear that it has is because video is not a good way to, to make a, to argue through a logical argument. It's not a good way to reason, right? Because that's not what video is very good at. Now you can reason and you can video it, but the video isn't adding the same oomph to it that it usually does. And so usually video is more moving people away from reasoning rather than toward reasoning. And so like a logical argument that you said, written is a very different. And even if you're, if you're preaching a sermon and making a logical argument, that, that still people can follow that argument. If you try to make an argument just with pictures, without words, you're not gonna, that argument is not going to carry very well. 
where people actually consider it and think about it. And so if all you're doing is sitting there and absorbing images all the time, it does have a tendency to dumb you down. I mean, I want to refine that just a little bit sure. to, to say that's particularly true of abstract cases. It, it, if you're trying to convey abstract ideas, if you want to talk about politics, justice, interpretation of the Bible, all those kinds of things. Um, if you want to talk about how to change the carburetor on your automobile, then in many cases— But I was saying a logical argument, well, which I but, would— but yeah, but guess you, maybe how you. But you were it. talking in, in terms of, of right. reasoning, and there are certain kinds of, if you will, demonstrations that sure. it's a lot easier to have somebody show you how to do it. And and meanwhile, that interestingly, they can't just have the images by themselves. Typically speaking, you need that explanation along the way. When you're not talking about this sort of thing for which there's an easy visual analog. When you want to talk about something that's more complicated, when you want to talk about justice, give expressions of justice, words are going to do so much better than the images. The images can, can actually confound things because you can start playing with people's emotions. You can, right. you can start manipulating. And that's whether or not you're trying to do a documentary of it, whether you're trying to film a, a, a movie, you know, any, to, in order to convey that idea. There's, there's all sorts of ways in which that can complicate it. And, you know, playing with uh, emotions and making the emotional argument, I mean, that's, I mean, you, you look at advertising and that's, I mean, that's kind of the core of video advertising is saying, how can we, how can we do that? And of course you can do it with text. It's just not, not as easy um, where you, you know, you have the, the sad people using your competitor's product and the happy people using your product. Well, you know, subtly right there, you've, you've just, you're, you're trying to manipulate people. At an emotional level. I mean, level. by definition, I would guess you could say any form of advertising is trying to manipulate and not, not in a pejorative sense. But you're trying to move somebody to, to take action. You're trying to get them to, to purchase your product or desire your product or consider your product. And, and hey, you know, showing them your product is not necessarily a bad thing. I, you know, we, we should say that. Um, <laughs> But what are but you it, selling? <laughs> right, you know, if but if you start clouding that with a whole bunch of other accessory images in order to manipulate them, like beer commercials are never about beer; they're about the happiness of life that comes with this particular brand of beer. You know, and the the point isn't that it's wrong for video to affect people's emotions. You know, if, no. If you're having a if you're having a video about the Holocaust, you know, it's appropriate that you. You know, you feel sad at the end, and perhaps it's appropriate that you feel sadder than if you had read a book about the Holocaust. And, the, you know, but the question is, you know, whether you're the person making the media or consuming the media, you know, do you understand the, you know, the logic of what the words are saying um, and what truth is versus, and is the, is the emotional appeal of it, is it matching that? Is it going beyond it? You know, and just to be, be aware of that and, and, and understand, am I, you know, am I being manipulated in a contrary and to what the words even, would lead to be? Even using the Holocaust as an example, there's a lot difference between you can manipulate people about the Holocaust that causes them to have emotions. And you maybe get the same emotions out of actually showing pictures of people that were released from a death camp, for instance. But boy, the, the emotion that you get from pictures of people being released from a death camp seem to me to be much more legitimate and more long-lasting than some video that somebody manipulated to get your emotions, even if the emotions are the same. Because the one's not based on the same reality that the other is based on. You know what I mean? That the, the idea that you can use music to manipulate emotions and words and pictures and you do all these things to get an emotional response rather than the emotional response to be, look at how much, look at how depraved man is. The ease with which you can manipulate someone with video and associated music, because it's it's very rare for someone to do video of things just where they're just doing images where they don't also include music. There's a part of it where we lose the ability to generate emotion from reason. And you know, I mean, I think it's it's one of the things I've noticed is you can. It used to be someone could get news of something horrible that happened, and they could feel something. And there's this part of it where we've gotten. We've almost gotten conditioned, in a sense, to how we feel. 
that we only because we've gotten used to be to feeling when we're sort of you know the music hits that note the music hits that tone and you go oh you know here we go and it could be you know there's i mean i remember like watching like on mother's day at&t would make a commercial about the kid calling home you know i mean you i mean something that simple can really can cause people to have very 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 strong emotions on the level of seeing something about the holocaust i mean and someone else could have incredibly intense emotions this is a d- correct dramatic mo- music and everything right. else that drives i mean i remember that watching view. you know uh the the film um what was the one about uh, saving private ryan i mean and the beginning of that film and the ending of that film are what, some of the most powerfully emotional moments but the thing is is i shouldn't have to see it pitched in that perfect way to be able to feel that 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 shouldn't be a necessity and there starts to be a point where you can't feel it without being able to see those things and see it in the way that you've seen it and see it in your your expectations being fulfilled and so we've lost the ability for our mind to be able to bring us to a point where we go this is important well and and you even just the way you're describing it makes me think that what Part, what the real dangerous shift is that we've been we've been talking about here is that it's really about getting you to feel a certain way, not getting you to think a certain way. Right. And that the the use of images and and the way that they've been proliferated through the culture has been a part, you know, both a, a leader and a follower of that kind of particular shift. That it's really important how people feel, and not so important how people think. Because you can manipulate feelings easier than you can manipulate somebody through rational arguments. In both of these, whether it's music or whether it's it's images, those can manipulate emotions easier than words can. I mean, it's hard to manipulate emotions. And I'm not saying that you can't stir real emotions with words. You can. There's no question about that. But I think they tend to be more more anchored than they are if you have images or music that are driving it. Because it's anchored in your reason. And when you think, you know, what it says in Romans 12, that we're supposed to take every thought captive for Christ. I mean, that's, it doesn't say take all your emotions captive. It's take every thought captive, which doesn't mean you should be emotionless. I mean, Jesus wept. It's not saying you're, but taking the thought captive should be what controls the emotions. Your emotions shouldn't drive your thoughts. Right now, they do enough of a sob story that everybody's feeling sorry. And all of a sudden they're thinking, you know, you look at, a lot of the organizations that are feeding children in Africa are just basically con jobs, right? There was one that I forget which one it was down in Oklahoma where they basically came in, a new CEO came in and said, this is all fake. The whole thing's fake. And lots of people see the images of the children in Africa and they see their distended stomachs and they go, oh, I need to help this person. And so they send the money and their emotions drove their thoughts. They actually sent money because the emotions drove their thoughts. And they didn't think through, well, how do we make sure that the people actually receive the money? Because there was no accountability anywhere with that. They just assumed it was accountable. But the reality is there's, you know, when emotions are driving thoughts, it causes huge problems. And that's basically where our political system is now. We did a podcast on that particular kind of thing on those those sorts of charities. And one of the things that we talked about there in that context really applies here and that we said hey what those charities are selling you when they're asking for your money is a feeling Mm -hmm. they're they're manipulating you into a point where you think that you can buy a feeling of doing good without having to actually do anything other than donate some money and and then it's all fake because much of it or none of it ends up going to where it ought to I mean, I think something that's related at least to this, and I want to start off with something that isn't directly related to images and then kind of tie it back. So, like, at our church, one of the practices we do is at the end of the sermon, we have have a time for men, you know, to to speak and either ask questions. And one of the effects that does is it, it, it it puts constraints on the speaker. If the speaker knows that at the end of their talk, there are going to be people who are going to be able to ask questions, there are things that they have to be more careful about what they say. There's a part of it where, I mean, you know, it's like it's you go to a company site and you do a sales presentation. If, if you know that it's a lock and that everybody there wants it to happen, you can get away with saying, I mean, if you wanted to, you could get away with saying certain things and it, it would slide by. If you're dealing with a hostile crowd, 
you have to be very careful because that one person who goes, this is all well and good what you just said, but how are you going to solve problem X, Y, and Z? I'd like you to describe that. And then all of your swelling rhetoric, all of your pretty things that you've said, they they just mm-hmm. fall apart. And there's this part of it where this is this is what we're talking about in the sense of that it's not intrinsic to images, but it is intrinsic to the way they become in the way they are frequently used is they don't want you to think afterwards and ask yourself, does this all hold together? And there's kind of like we're talking about, like I mentioned, like you go to a place and everybody wants this to happen. The most dangerous videos are the ones that are selling you a lie that you want to be true. Because if at the end of it, you ever been watching a movie with someone and you want to watch the movie and they go, oh, that doesn't work that way. You know, that would never, this is my wife, you know, frequently, this is why I hate watching movies with you. You know, you know oh, well, that would never work. That would never, and what's really interesting is if you go back and you look at like science fiction from like the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, it was full of them, the author trying to describe to you why you should believe this. They would spend more time trying to convince you, whereas today we've just agreed this is a trope. We're just going to assume that space travel is possible, Interna- you know, the interstellar travel is possible. We're just going to assume that time travel is possible. We're going to assume that someone could pick up something that weighs so much and their feet wouldn't sink. In, you know, all of these things, because we there's this desire to cause you to disengage your mind and not ask yourself, is what I saw, does it hold together? But don't you think that, I mean, over the last 75 years with all the increase in images, don't you think we've just gotten to be less reasoned? I mean, we just don't think. We're so used to absorbing the lies that we can't even, we don't even try to see truth anymore. And that's kind of before people were so used to seeing truth that they would see the lie and you'd have to build stuff up to get them over the lie. Right. And that's kind of what I'm saying is, is there's this part of it where the you have to actively fight and ask yourself, is what I'm being told true? Because we've gotten so conditioned and so used to this. And it's this progressive thing. But what I'm saying is, is you have to actually build things in to cause people to do that. And I was saying, that's part of why I started with the church services, because like the examples before is you can have a church service that's functionally exactly like a video. You can have one where no one asks any questions. If you ask a question, you get smacked, and the person just can do. And all that matters is that the rhetoric falls into it. Fits it hits the notes, it hits the patterns, it goes, and and it's pleasing to the ear. And everybody goes, "That was fantastic." But when someone goes, "But wait, what about this verse over here? What about this verse over here? How do you reconcile these things together?" And everything falls apart. But people don't want that to happen, so they don't ask the questions. And so. What I'm saying is, is there's a part of it where we've gotten to this point because the, the church has gotten away from these things because we've, we've rejected truth collectively over time. And, and the Bible talks about that progression. You know, we're, we're talking about the, the end, to, or, or at least what seems like the end of a line. But it talks about, hey, one of the first things that's going to happen is you're going to assemble speakers who will tell you what you want to hear. And you will, you're just going to be interested in following after people who speak the kinds of fables that, that you are ready to hear. And then once you've gotten to the point where you're comfortable with just being deceived, where you're, you're an active participant in your own deception, then you're ripe for any number of deceptions. Right. And, and, and you, you just back up and you say, hey, are we a culture that really loves and cares about truth? Are we a culture that loves and cares about reasoned and detailed arguments through things? And no, we're not. You know, right. we're we're a culture of thirty-second videos. And has that affected us in any kind of way? It has to have. But you have to back up and pause and think about it and think it didn't always used to be this way. It doesn't have to be this way, but it is. Why? What does that mean? Right, and I think it's a it's a shift that's happened over the last couple of generations, and it's a big shift, and it's it's going to have long term repercussions going forward. Is that if we're a thoughtless people, and we are very much a thoughtless people, how do you how do you progress in the next generation? I mean, there's an answer to that because it's not the first time that you've had a thoughtless people who are an image based culture. Right. Oh, I know what usually happens. You know, judgment, and then. That causes people to repent. I mean, I, I remember somebody, a, a history uh, lecture once where somebody was talking about the way that cathedrals were designed, and, and he was walking around this one particular cathedral, and there were all of these 
pictures of Bible stories that were about knee high. And then you realized, oh, these are pictures of Bible stories in order to teach children stories from the Bible. Not that much different than the picture Bibles that we were making fun of earlier. But that was in a culture that didn't believe that, that, that what that culture said was, hey, we don't think that people can read. They're not literate. And we're not going to train them to read. So in order to educate them about the Bible, we'll use pictures. And it was... It didn't work. It did not work to educate the people right. for about what the Bible really meant, about what God really says. And so the reformers come along, and the, and the story kind of tells it's the same story over and over throughout Europe of some monk somewhere found a Bible that hadn't been read for a while. He reads the Bible. He becomes saved. He says, everybody around me needs to know about this, eventually gets translated into the language. And instead of saying, oh, there's a bunch of illiterate people here who can't read. Let's make pictures for them. They said, there's a bunch of illiterate people around here who can't read. Let's teach them to read. And that's what they did, and they moved from an image-based culture to a word-based culture that really dominated the Western world until relatively recently. So it's possible to go back. It and really you, is. And, and we have we a head will. start because you know a lot more people know how to read than do 500 years ago. I mean, and you should. And here's something that I think a lot of people miss about this story, or that what you're saying here is there's a part of it where what we're talking about is people think technology drives everything. When this was going on, the printing press had been around for a while before it, I mean, about, how, 100 years. about 100 years, and it really didn't have any use. The printing press, I mean, they had, the, there were things they would print, but there was nowhere near because most people couldn't read. But people started printing the Bible, people started being able to read, and the printing press actually found a use by the Bible, by God's Word. And so there's this part of it where when you look at the world, you go, technology drives all of this. It's like virtual reality comes out, and people go, everyone's going to go to virtual reality. And it is, a, it is a danger in the sense of you should go, it's a next step, and you know, you can go from reading to radio to TV, and you cut out part of the world, and VR lets you cut out even more of the world. There's things that there are limitations to how far you can go without losing control of everything. And but technology isn't what drives the world. And everybody thinks it is. No, there are other forces in the world that are more powerful than technology. And it's really important for the church to remember that. Because if you understand history, you go, it wasn't it wasn't the printing press that transformed the world. It was the fact that people wanted to read God's word and people used the printing press to cause that to happen. I mean, I think it is, I mean, in that story, just to give timelines, right, I think it was 782, if I remember correctly, when the Roman Catholic Church said that they were going to start to use images rather than the word. And so this is something like 740 years or 750 years that this went on before it started to be turned back, just to... It's worth considering that because in a real sense, and it has been going on longer than that, and I don't think it will go on 750 years this time again, but at the same time, you know, in the 50s is where we really started to make the Im shift to images. And we're only 75 years in. And look at how much damage it's already done. Look at how, how much dumbed down the culture already is. And so we should just recognize the power of it. And, and there's only one thing that can ever bring it back, and that's the Church of Jesus Christ that says we're the pillar and ground of the truth. We have the Word, and the Word is what saves instead of images. And I want to tell another story that's even farther back. And you go back, and just look at the Bible that you have and consider some of the authors of that Bible. You've got somebody like Peter, who's a fisherman. At the time that he's writing, there is no place in the world other than this little corner of Palestine where you would have had a literate fisherman who could write something that is now preserved for all of history. Nowhere else in— Well, that's not quite true because there were synagogues that had throughout the Roman oh, Empire. There fine. were synagogues where they could read. But if you were not no a Jew, other, you could not read. No, <laughs> other, no other culture other than this Jewish culture where you would have expected somebody with that kind of a profession to also be literate and capable of writing something like that. And why is that? Well, it's because at one point God said, hey, you're going to worship me by word. You're not going to worship me by image. And that, that structured their entire culture for millennia, even, even in times where their culture was very wicked and turned far away, just having that as the background changed them in ways and made them distinct from the entire rest of the world. 
And the stories are, right, that they lost the book of the law. They find the book of the law. Their culture is transformed. I mean, that happens a couple times in the Old Testament. And so their, even their history is that this is what fixes your culture when it really gets out of whack. So is the answer to tell people to read their Bibles? Well, of course, but... <laughs> is it that simple? Well, they need it to can't be. They, 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 they listen to, to this <laughs> podcast for too long for that to be our answer, to just read your Bible. No. One of the checks that I was saying before, right, like with the three wise men as you read your Bible, and that corrects it. It corrects the image. But what we always need to recognize is that to make an image for something like that, unless it's actually a picture of a historical event, even like the Holocaust, you make that image, you always have to add information to that image. And by adding that information, the term for that is a lie because it's not true. And so you make this information that, you know, when you ever do a depiction, say it's even in a documentary and you're trying to do a depiction of, of you know, you're trying to do a pe- depiction of the Holocaust. Well, you add all kinds of things that aren't true to it. And now you can do better and you can work to do better and you can try to be as accurate as possible. But in the end, when you're actually starting to tell a story, we just need to recognize how much additional information needs to be added that people don't know in order to tell a story with video. Because there is usually a huge amount in anything historical, whether it's the Bible or not, there's a huge amount that we have to basically make up. Which is when you're saying this is what it was like and then you make something up, there's a term for that and that's a lie. And this isn't to say that that temptation isn't there with words. It's, oh. just that, it's just that the demand is so much higher for you to be satisfied with the video. In other words, like the video without doing it, what would you have, right? I mean, you start thinking about it. We're going to show a depiction of Abraham going up the mountain with his son. Well, you need to figure out what Abraham looked like. You need to have figure out what his son looked like. You need to figure out what their clothing would have been. You need to figure out what they would have, you know, you need to figure out what the terrain would have been. You need, you know what I mean? It's like, so we could just have, well, we could just have an, uh, you know what I mean? You start, and if you don't do those things, people would go, I'm not interested in watching it. Whereas if you were just talking in words and saying Abraham and his son went up the mountain, you can say that. I mean, and you can, and you don't have to say on the way up the mountain, they walked past these things. But if you're doing a video, you, you have they to, put have the to walk in past there. those things, right? Otherwise, it's a featureless mountain. You know what I mean? And in, in the mountain that, that Abraham took Isaac up, how steep was it? Right. We don't know. <laughs> right. There's a whole bunch of information. We just don't know because we don't need to know it. And all that information needs to be added in. We just need to recognize that when you're looking at a video, how much information has to be added in that isn't, isn't true. It may not even be intentionally false. But it isn't true. Thinking about something like the Jesus film, where, okay, l- let's stick to the text of Scripture, but depict, act out what was happening there. You cannot do that without adding information that is above and beyond what Scripture has recorded, because we don't know what Jesus looked like. We don't know what a particular area looked like. We don't know what color walls were painted. We don't know the clothes were like in, there's so many things that you have to put in there in order to tell a compelling visual story think about what was happening with the Jesus film and then say well because of the way that we have trained ourselves as a culture look at where we are now with say a TV series like The Chosen which if you've followed us this far in the podcast none of us are going to be fans of but We'd have to know what it is first. Of well, anyway. <laughs> so so the chosen is is incredibly popular with the the conservative Christian crowd television show right now. That is a depiction of mostly the lives of the twelve disciples, produced by Mormons. Yeah, and and a lot of it prior to to their inner, or you know a lot of it's about how Jesus what the lives that they led before Jesus found them, and then Jesus finds them, and how he changes them, and and. Ninety-five percent of the story that they're telling is extra biblical. Not just—it's—it's it's not right. even just hey, we're going to use Bible words and then show pictures to go along with it while we read from the gospel. It's a uh, hey, we're just going to make stuff up that might have happened. And Christians think, oh, this is leading us to Jesus. And if you—you you know, if you want to know, you know, how how far this goes, you know, in the Middle Ages, I mean, one of the main. You know, art that they did was 
bi- with biblical art, you know, like we've said. Um, but it turns out today one of the best sources for what medieval weaponry and clothing looks like were the Bibles, because when they were illustrating it, they were I'm, they were probably trying to do it historically accurate. But historically accurate meant they were drawing, you know, it was basically self portraits. And you know, we might look at you know the stuff that's produced now. And maybe it is technically more accurate than the medieval Bibles, but when it comes down to it, it's still a self-portrait and not portraying what it actually was. Their pictures of the three wise men were of three Venetian businessmen. Right. And, I mean, you, when you go to Nigeria and they do pictures of Jesus, they're all darker skin than the depictions of Jesus in the United States. I mean, it's just the way that it works. And it is worth noting that, you know, when Ben-Hur came out, and I forget when it came out, in the 30s or maybe early 40s, something like that, they had a picture in there where Jesus' hands were on the screen. And the churches were trying to get the movie shut down because they had violated the second commandment. And now we're to the point where you have the chosen. I mean, and this was a big deal, that, that there was a big fight about this, whether this should be allowed in any theater, because not, they didn't show his face. They just showed right, his, right, hands. his hands. Right. And because of that, that was supposed to be. And I now mean, churches <laughs> look back and say that, you know, Ben-Hur was one of the greatest, you know, Christian right. films. Right. Because it showed such and honor it, to Jesus Christ compared Charlton to. Charlton Heston from <laughs> Moses was in there. Because he was the NRA. And, and the NRA. <laughs> <laughs> Both equally important for Christianity. I know. <laughs> but we just look at how, how fast that has shifted. And it is pretty, pretty remarkable. And that we forget the things that our fathers knew and the things that, that you know, our grandfathers knew that said, you know, even non-Christians went, this, this really isn't right. And now we're to the point where the professing Christians are going, no, this is wonderful. I mean, it's a very dangerous thing. And it's, it's a slope that we're on that we're going to, you know, there'll be a point where, where the church repents, but we need to recognize the level of repentance that's required. Or God will cause the church to repent, right? Yeah, God will cause the church to repent, yeah. It's easy for us not to recognize the danger of the Jesus film because it's easy for us to just think, well, it's, it's, you know, it's the words of Luke, so how could you be, even though it's not, they add in a lot of other words because... They had to. They had to because they had to have a narrative flow that doesn't work just going from the words from Luke. But... But to recognize the effect of it, you have to realize that there's people that, like the actor, I forget what, Brian Deacon, I think is his name, that he like got thousands of letters from people that think he's Jesus. And there's people who watch the Jesus film, and you, you know, the, the depiction of it is that you go into this place where they've never had power, as a lot of the places that they're showing this. They come in with a generator. They come in with a big screen. They come into this village that has never had power, and they start to show the Jesus film. And the people are awed by the story of Jesus. They're not awed by the generator. They're not awed by the power that they never saw before. They're not awed by the fact that you could make a movie. Right, just the power of video itself, right? Yeah, and and then when they say they profess Jesus, and they say 200 million people have come forward because of this, that, that they come forward and who are they praying to? When they close their eyes and they say, who is this, who is Jesus, they're imagining that actor. And again, God is a jealous God. And that doesn't mean none of them are saved. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is you've already damaged and put a stumbling block to their faith. You've already made it harder for them to believe in the true Jesus because you said to them, whatever his name is, Brian Deacon, I think, you said to them, this is Jesus. That's an incredibly dangerous thing to do because who are they worshiping? And the reality is some, God saves people all kinds of ways. God saves people through sin. So it's not saying people can't come to salvation, but it is saying that there's a whole bunch of people that came that, that really have no reason to think that they're not just worshiping the people that brought this technology that did these things that they had never seen before, these miraculous things. And so all of a sudden you have these places that are Christian in name only because they're really just worshiping the technology and they're not worshiping Christ. And and we got there because Christians thought that the gospel was insufficient. We got there because we thought that the message of the gospel delivered like it had been for thousands of years, like Jesus said to deliver it, wasn't sufficient. 
we needed to add to it. And it is an inherently an Arminian viewpoint. And people need to recognize that the reform view is you don't do these things. And there's a reason why. Because if you believe that it's man that needs to make the decision and you need to persuade man, then you do whatever is necessary to persuade man. If he's the one that is the final actor of salvation, it doesn't matter what you need to do. You need to save the person. So if it's video that works, if it's lying to him that works, if, it, if it's whatever works, if it's motorcycles jumping over the preacher, if that works, do it. Because you're saying it's not God who saves. When you say God who's, it's God who saves, you say faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So why are you using images? Because that's not what saves. That's, what's, that's, the, that's what the scriptures say. That's not what saves. What saves is the word of God. And so why are you messing with images? So it is inherently an Arminian viewpoint that it's not God is not the author of salvation. Man is the author of his own salvation in the end. <laughs> it's Jesus talking to Nicodemus when he says the wind blows where it wills. And there's this part of it where the, one of the reasons we turn to video is because when you turn to video in these things, is they always come with their power. With whatever power video has, you turn it on, and it ha- I mean, it brings it with it every time. If whatever, And there's a part of it where there are times you'll stand in front of someone and you'll say the words of God, and you don't see a result, and you don't see a reaction. And the truth is, is God's saying there are people who I, you speak the words to, and they and I use it to turn them away from the gospel. I use it and I make their heart hard. There are people, you know what I mean? And there's just, like you're saying, in the end, it is we are turning to it because we want to see the results. We want to see every time, and we're not interested in God's results. It goes back to what we said at the beginning with the second commandment, that the, the, uh, the admonitions about images, there's a part of it where the language of idolatry is images. And, you need, and we need to understand it doesn't mean that all images are idolatry, but the language of idolatry is images, and we need to understand that and be Certainly dangerous. one of the – we shouldn't, right, I shouldn't say that only, exclusive, right. but it is the most powerful language of idolatry is right. images. And so we just need to understand when you're doing this, you're playing around with things that you could be leading other people to idolatry. And if you, do, if you go into it with that attitude, you will lead them to idolatry. I mean, I remember, you know, it's probably some years ago now when Brokeback Mountain came out. And you, they would interview people going into this film. And this film was about a man that was married that then has a, a, a regular homosexual relationship with another man. And finally he abandons his wife and children, I believe, or child and then runs off and has a sodomite relationship with this man. You hear that story in words, and it's like, this is like pure evil, right? I mean, the person abandons all his responsibilities. He stops caring for his wife. He stops caring for his child. His child is subject to to his whims of his sexual proclivities. And yet, you do that in a movie, and people that were walking in with conservatives saying, yeah, I'm against homosexuality, walk out and go, but maybe there is a place for it because they love each other. And this is the power of it, and we just need to recognize, and that is idolatry, by the way, right? Because homosexuality is very tied to idolatry. It always has been tied to idolatry. And so you look at that, and you look at how you're able to get people to follow after another god with images, it's just, it's just very powerful. In my generation, the parents didn't know what the words of the songs meant because they're, the songs were frequently, the rock songs are all about sexual things, but the sexual slang, the parents didn't know. And so the songs are about things that they thought were okay and were not. And I think there's a lot of images now that are the same way that an older person's like looking at them and doesn't recognize all the messages that are being embedded in those images to promote you know, really wicked and perverse things. And we should just recognize that, that you know, words, you can't, you can't deceive people with words in the same way. Because the words, regardless of how you describe the story of Brokeback Mountain, somebody who's actually thought things through will go, this is really evil. But you can do it with images and people will be persuaded by them. And this isn't, you know, are they hiding something secret in the Disney film in the background for a second? This is the plot of the Disney film. Right. The plot of the di- one of the modern Disney films is two homosexual characters. I mean, they're just like pushing this and they're pushing it just very blatantly and very obviously. And yet people aren't looking there going, well, my child wants to be entertained. He finds this fun. He sings the songs on it. So we'll let him watch it. 
And, and my, I mean, as far as kids being influenced by images, I mean, there's all these people complaining that, well, you know, if I just set my kid on YouTube and it just auto plays for hours, sometimes it ends up on bad videos. Like, wait a second. <laughs> what are you thinking? <laughs> that, that's not really YouTube's problem. I'm sorry. <laughs> One of the things that has driven the use of images in our society is the lack of satisfaction in the church with the Word of God, and that God has given us enough information. He has given us things that we can meditate on and that the depths of are unfathomable, but yet instead we want to make them super superficial by adding images in. If the church was satisfied with the Word of God, if it was satisfied with the knowledge, if it was satisfied with reasoning, then the society would change. It's happened before. The church needs to be working to make it happen again. Thanks for joining us. This has been The Conquering Truth, a project of Reformation Baptist Church. If you found this helpful, you can visit us online at theconqueringtruth.com and subscribe here or in your favorite podcast app. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching.